Welcome to the eighth year of the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series. I want to thank all of you for coming to tonight's lecture by Michael Clare. This lecture series was created in honor and in memory of my husband, Will Miller, a social justice activist and professor of philosophy who taught at UVM for 35 years. As our logo for the lecture series says, Will will always be remembered as a clear voice in a world of false words and disinformation. Our mission, which Will helped to construct, brings speakers to the UVM campus and the Burlington community to provide a continuing program of radical analysis of social, ecological, and political concerns. We have brought to the Burlington community the following speakers. David Klein, president of, the, of Veterans for Peace, who spoke at the 2005 Vermont Says No to War conference. Samir Dasani from 50 Years is Enough, speaking on the topic of globalization, immigration, and war. Poet and author John Ross and musician Jim Page shared the stage at our event, a celebration for the earth, music, art, and inspiration. Bill Blum spoke on the terror of war. Christian Parenti's lecture was titled Climate War, the Violent Geography of Global Warming. Bill Taub and Fred Magdoff spoke about the financial crisis of capitalism. Sonali Kalhatkar talked about America's, quote, good war, unquote, in Afghanistan, occupation, oppression, and resistance. The roots of the world ecological crisis, a critique of unsustainable development and its deep roots in global capitalist society was presented by John Bellamy Foster. After the earthquake, the struggle to transform Haiti was presented by Roger LeDuc and Kim Eaves. Jihan Jiron from the Indigenous Environmental Network spoke to us about the people versus the market in the fight for climate justice. Green Gone Wrong, How Our Economy is Undermining the Environmental Revolution was presented by Heather Rogers. Why does the U.S. have a cap... Start again. Why does the U.S. have a global empire was presented by Michael Parenti. And our last lecture was presented by Francis Fox Piven on protest movements and social change, lessons from history. What an amazing list. Will would, would have um, appreciated being in the audience for all of these topics and would have been impressed by each of these speakers. He would have enjoyed meeting them, talking to them, and debating with them. Will was an amazing social justice activist. He offered reasoned and insightful analyses into the origins and workings of capitalism and imperialism, giving us both a call to struggle and a vision of a more just society. When he spoke, we listened. He helped us to understand topics that felt too big to understand. We were incredibly lucky to have him in our lives for as long as we did. Will's voice was powerful, especially in encouraging others to speak up and be heard. He had an unwavering commitment to the struggle against war and for social justice, and an amazing ability to move others into action. Will would be so incredibly proud of the faculty members, staff, and students who are continuing to speak out in the name of social justice, both on campus and off. I want to recognize and thank the board of the lecture series for their work to determine topics for the lectures and for their help in finding speakers who are current on the issues that Will would want us to be discussing. Our current members are Helen Scott, Fred Magdoff, Mike Cassidy, Will Bennington, Ron Jacobs, Ann Peterman, and myself. We could not do this work without the generous support of people like yourself who make donations to the lecture series. We hope that you will assist us in keeping Will's legacy alive by making a contribution tonight in the plastic bins which will be quietly passed around to place donations in during the lecture. I'm not sure that I've adequately spoken to our need for donations in the past, so I'm doing that now, encouraging. We have a number of other organizations who have co-sponsored this event. We are grateful to the following. UVM's Environmental Program, Plant and Soil Science Department, International Socialist Organization, and Students for Justice in Palestine. Off-campus sponsors include Global Justice Ecology Project, St. Michael's Political Science Department, and the Will Miller Green Mountain Veterans for Peace Chapter. A few years ago, I began the tradition of reading a favorite poem of Will's and mine at the lecture series events. This poem was written by Howard Zinn, 
another extraordinary social justice activist and university professor who was also greatly missed. It offers us inspiration in trying times, which never seem to end. On Getting Along in Difficult Times by Howard Zinn. You ask how I managed to stay involved and remain seemingly happy and adjusted to this awful world where the efforts of caring people pale in comparison to those who have power? It's easy. First, don't let those who have power intimidate you. No matter how much power they have, they cannot prevent you from living your life, speaking your mind, thinking independently, having relationships with people as you like. Read Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life. Harassed, even imprisoned by authority, she insisted on living her life, speaking out however she felt. Second, find companions who have your values, your commitments, but who also have a sense of humor. That combination is a necessity. Third, Notice how precise is my advice that I can confidently number it the way scientists number things. Understand that the major media will not tell you of all the acts of resistance taking place every day, the strikes, the protests, the individual acts of courage in the face of authority. Look, and you will certainly find it, for evidence of these unreported acts. And for the little you find, extrapolate from that and assume there must be a thousand times as much as, as you have found. Fourth, note that throughout history, people have felt powerless before authority, but that at certain times, these powerless people, by organizing, acting, risking, persisting, have created enough power to change the world around them, even if only a little bit or briefly. Fifth, Remember, those who have power and who seem invulnerable are in fact quite vulnerable. Their power depends on the obedience of others. And when those others begin with withholding that obedience, begin defying authority, that power at the top turns out to be quite fragile. Generals become powerless when their soldiers refuse to fight. Industrialists become powerful, powerless <laughs> when their workers leave their jobs or occupy the factories. Sixth, when we forget the fragility of power imposed from above, we become astounded when it crumbles in the face of rebellion. We have had many such surprises in our time, both in the United States and in other countries. Seventh, don't look for a moment of total triumph. See it as an ongoing struggle, with victories and defeats, but consciousness of people growing over the long run. So you need patience, persistence, and you need to understand that even when you don't win, there is fun and fulfillment in the fact that you have been involved with other good people in something worthwhile. Okay, seven pieces of profound advice should be enough. Howard Zinn. It's like a privilege to read that poem each time. Um, so now I would like to introduce you to Eric Wallenberg, a graduate student in the history department here at UVM. He'll introduce Michael Clare, who will give our spring lecture. And again, these containers, I'm going around for you to quietly put money in, uh, donations in, and there'll be um, sign-up sheets so you can be informed of future activities that we're doing. Thanks, Anne. In bringing Professor Michael Clare to speak here at UVM, I can't help but think that Will would be delighted. As an undergraduate at UVM, I, like so many other students, had heard about Will's legendary Marxism class. So in September 2001, I excitedly enrolled and was awed by Will's 
vast knowledge and ability to convey complex history and theory in a really comprehensible way. Of course, September 2001 would turn out to be a decisive moment for U.S. empire. Will quickly turned his class into a place to discuss the tragedy of September 11th and to try and understand the roots of that tragedy. I was transformed during that semester and was proud to stand alongside Will and many others who argued and demonstrated against the U.S. war drive, first in Afghanistan and then within 18 months in Iraq. So many of the concerns that Michael Clare considers in his writing and teaching are issues that Will cared about and organized around during his life. Michael Clare brilliantly connects questions of war and peace to environmental concerns in informative and innovative ways. Professor Clare is the director of the five college program in peace and world security studies at Hampshire College in Amherst. He is a defense correspondent for the nation and is a contributor to current history, foreign affairs, and the Los Angeles Times. He's the author of 14 books dealing with a range of issues from American arms dealing to global resource wars. Among them, Rising Powers, Shrinking Planet, The New Geopolitics of Energy was praised by Vermont's very own founder of 350.org, Bill McKibben. McKibben wrote, quote, if you want to understand the future of international relations, worry less about ideology and more about oil reserves. Michael Clare's superb book explains in haunting detail the trends that will lead us into a series of dangerous traps unless we muster the will to transform the way we use energy in this country, as illuminating as it is unsettling. This troubling description of our world is given further argument by Professor Clare in an article titled, Is Barack Obama Morphing into Dick Cheney? <laughs> he also has clever titles. <laughs> now, I won't talk much about this article, but in it, Michael Clare argues that the policies relentlessly pursued by Cheney while vice president are now being implemented in every respect by President Obama. And this warning, in this warning, he discusses the dangers of drilling in, in environmentally fragile offshore areas, which we've seen the results of, and the use of hazardous techniques like hydrofracking. The description for Michael Clare's most recent book, The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources, explains in part that, quote, the world is facing an unprecedented crisis of resource depletion, a crisis that encompasses shortages of oil and coal, copper and cobalt, water and arable land. With all of the Earth's accessible areas already being exploited, the desperate hunt for supplies has now reached the final frontiers. The race for what's left takes us from the Arctic to war zones to deep ocean floors, from a Russian submarine planting the country's flag under the North Pole to the large-scale buying up of African farmland by Saudi Arabia and other food-scarce nations. With resource extraction growing more difficult, the environmental risks are becoming increasingly severe. And the intense search for dwindling supplies is, exciting, is igniting new conflicts and territorial disputes. The race for what's left has been praised as, quote, a first-rate, well-researched wake-up call by the Christian Science Monitor and simply stunning by Rolling Stone. The race for what's left is the kind of exhaustive research and analysis that can help illuminate the challenges we face in the fight for a better world and arm a generation with the ideas necessary for the struggle for a livable planet free of war and empire. Michael Clare is like Will Miller, a clear voice in a world of false words and disinformation. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Clare as the latest speaker for the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I want to say I, I'm very honored to be a Will Miller lecturer tonight. Um, and I feel like I'm in very good company with all those other folks. I wish I could have been here to hear them myself. Uh, some of them good friends, many of them people who I admire. So it's really a, a great honor to be in their company. Um, I hope I do them proud after all that. Um, and I'm very happy to be here at UVM. 
and I admire much of the work that's being done here. So I hope what I have to say will be of interest to you and will be stimulating. And basically what I look forward to is the discussion we have after I speak. So first you have to hear me, then we have conversation. Uh, so I'm going to talk tonight about two phenomena, two words that are not part of our usual everyday conversation, extraction and depletion. Now, extraction is a word that I usually only hear in my dentist's office. And no disrespect to anybody in the room who's a dentist. I admire my dentist, but it's, I don't like going to the dentist's <laughs> office. And depletion, as I'll explain, is the most threatening word in the English language for economists today. Uh, so these are very heavy loaded words, extraction and depletion. That's what I want to talk about. And in fact, what I want to argue is that we are facing on the planet a crisis of hyper-extraction. And this crisis uh, is uh, of great potential threat to all of us. And by that I mean the intensified, aggressive pursuit of the world's last resources at a dangerous and destructive rate. Now, one way to understand this before I go further talking about this is to look at its mirror opposite. This is one side of a symmetrical coin. The other side of that is hyper emissions, the um, hyper emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And I think you all have some sense of what I mean by that, that we are pumping out so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that the atmosphere cannot absorb them in a gradual linear matter, m manner, but uh, it, it, the rate is happening at, at such a fast and such an intensive rate that we have to expect nonlinear surprise events, very powerful events occurring, uh, powerful storms, as we've already seen, prolonged droughts, persistent heat waves, and so on. That is the other side of the coin of what I'm going to speak about. And I think you all understand that this is going to be one of the greatest threats to human civilization. And I don't have to explain that because so many people have done such a good job of that, uh, including Vermont's own Bill McKibben, who I greatly admire. But I want to talk with you about the less well understood or the side of the coin, and that is extraction and depletion. Extraction is the beginning of the process. Extraction is the beginning of the process of consumption. The end result, of course, after we consume things, after we burn things, or otherwise process things, consume them, are waste products which we dump into our rivers, uh, into the air, however we, cons however we dispose of our waste products, that's the end process. The beginning of the process is extraction. And before we can consume, we have to extract. And that is to say, we have to appropriate raw materials from Mother Earth and convert them into the substances that we use for our everyday life. Now, <clears throat> Originally, humans did this simply by scavenging, by gathering the fruits of the forest, nuts and berries and the like. Then when we humans got a little more organized, we formed hunting bands and slaughtered the wild creatures of the planet until many of them were wiped out of existence. Our forebears did this for millions of years, and some still that do that today, hunter-gatherers. But ever since we became what's called civilized, uh, we humans have been organized around one principal objective, to more efficiently extract the resources of the earth, whether by damming and channeling its waters, by domesticating its plants, animals, mining and smelting its ores, or exploiting its hydrocarbon resources. That's what civilizations do. 
and what we call history is, I would maintain, the rise of civilizations based on the more and more efficient exploitation of resources, allowing the growth of population, the rise of cities, concentration of populations in cities and kingdoms, the establishment of armies, which in turn allows, allows uh, the more powerful cities to conquer surrounding areas, exploit their lands, grow bigger, create empires, until they reach the outer limits of their ability to technologically uh, extract and process the resources into food, energy, and the means of making war. That is human history in a nutshell. This has been a process that's been underway since the first great civilizations arose in the ancient Near East, in ancient Sumeria, uh, then the Babylonian and Persian empires, the Roman Empire, the Mayan, Incan, and Aztec empires, the Spanish, Dutch, French, Ottoman empires, all empires have followed this path. All these empires, of course, claim to be pursuing noble goals and the dictates of their respective gods. But all in reality were complex social machines aimed at the maximization of resource extraction for the purpose of meeting the ever-increasing material needs of their populations and the desires for wealth of their leaders. Now, perhaps you think I exaggerate. And perhaps you think that our civilization, Western industrial civilization, is different from all the others. And I'm happy to have a conversation, a discussion with you about that afterwards. Please feel free to challenge me on this point. In fact, I welcome a discussion about that. But the more I study human history, the more I'm struck by the recurring themes of what I would call extractionism or expansionism, driven by the pursuit of natural resources. I'm influenced, uh, I'll say, very much by uh, the book Collapse by Jared Diamond, by Charles Mann's book uh, 1491, by the book called The Green History of the Earth. All of these I recommend to you. And if you read uh, these histories of past empires and civilizations, I believe a distinct pattern arises. The great civilizations rise to prominence when they succeed in maximizing the extraction and utilization of natural resources, allowing them to support an ever-growing population and to generate ever-increasing wealth for the kings, the emperors, their families, the royal families, and their associated elites, the generals who, man the, who govern their armies, the high priests who sing their praises and who placate the gods on their behalf, the tax collectors who collect the wealth from the peasants so, to, so they can enjoy this wealth and to feed the armies, the palace builders, the artists who build the monuments to their greatness, and so on. All the empires of the past up to the present day uh, show these characteristics. And not to demean these, uh, these empires, uh, many of them persisted for hundreds of years and built great monuments and achieved great accomplishments. Uh, in my former life, uh, before I studied all this stuff, I studied the history of art and architecture and I could tell you uh, there are fantastic buildings in ancient Rome and the ancient Near East and the Mayan Empire, spectacular buildings, and their purpose is to glorify the kings and the gods for bringing about all this great wealth. But eventually, all these civilizations reached a similar conundrum. Their methodology, their technology of extraction reached the outer limits of what the natural environment could provide on a sustainable basis. And then the output began to fall short of their requirements. That is, it proved impossible 
to satisfy the material needs of the heartland of these civilizations with the existing methodology of extraction. Often climate change was a factor uh, in the limitation of what they were able to provide. It is at this point that empires and civilizations resort to what I would call hyper-extraction, the use of aggressive technologies to claw from the earth and from the environment more than can possibly be replaced in any real time in order to satisfy the immediate needs of the society, of the emperor and the empire, even if this means that future generations will in all likelihood be doomed to insufficiency, starvation, and collapse. We could see this, for example, in the Roman Empire's reliance on the ever-expanding conquest of new territories for the acquisition of slaves. Roman Empire's equivalent of oil was slavery. Slavery was the means of energy that kept the Roman Empire functioning, the, the means of production for food, for mining, for everything else. Uh, so the acquisition of slaves, of food, of gold, to compensate for the collapse of production in the Italian heartland of the Roman Empire, to a point where it expanded, where the Roman Empire could no longer provide sufficient soldiers and food to keep this thing operating and the system collapsed. Or you could see it in the Spanish Empire's reliance on gold and silver extracts from the Americas, a highly militarized uh, genocidal system of extraction to keep the um, Spanish Empire uh, afloat over ever more precarious Supply, lines of supply until that empire collapsed as well. And there are many other examples. What about our situation today? Can you hear me okay? Is this better? I think that our situation today bears a lot of resemblance to these past civilizations whether we're talking about the United States in particular, a modern industrial civilization in general, we are at a point in time where the methodology of extraction that we rely on to maintain our way of life, our resource intense way of life, is no longer capable of satisfying our consumptive needs. And so we are embarking, we are engaged in a process of what I call hyper-extraction that is unsustainable and will result in increasingly negative and lethal consequences for our current civilization. Now let me try to explain what I mean by this, and this is the subject of my new book, The Race for What's Left. Ever since World War II, we've experienced a stupendous, unprecedented expansion of the global economy. You're all aware of this. We've seen the creation of what we call the American way of life with a ranch house for every family, with two cars and a swimming pool in the back and a yacht for every family. You know this is the American way of life because you see it on TV. Everybody else in the world sees it on TV and thinks that we have this way of life. But I know that we all don't enjoy that, but many people do. We've seen the recovery of Europe and Japan and the creation of a refined cosmopolitan welfare state for many in that part of the world. And we've seen the rise of China and India and the addition of hundreds of millions of people to the global middle class. This is indeed an extraordinary achievement. We mustn't demean it, the fact that hundreds of millions of people who lived in poverty are now living in the middle class. That's extraordinary. Yes, it is. All of this was made possible through an equally extraordinary increase in the world's extractive capacities, an effort by the what, what are called the extractive industries, the oil and gas companies, mining companies, timber companies, 
agribusiness, and so on, to provide all of this wealth that all of us enjoy. The oil, coal, natural gas, uranium, iron, copper, aluminum, tin, cobalt, nickel, manganese, titanium, food, water, timber. You couldn't have the American way of life without those things. That's the building blocks. Without the increased production of those resources, it wouldn't be possible to enjoy all of that wealth. To acquire these resources, the extractive industries have had to look beyond their traditional sources of supply, most of which were in North America, the United States and Canada, Europe, Russia, and China. They've had to scour the earth, mostly going into what we used to call the third world, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia for new sources of supply. And it's only through the development over the past 60 years of oil fields in the Middle East and Africa and tin and copper and iron mines in Africa and Australia and in the islands of the Pacific and Latin America that we can have all of these raw materials that make possible the industrialization that we've seen. So we've scoured the earth, every square foot of the earth that could possibly harbor valuable materials has been searched, developed, exploited, and is currently in production. But we have now hit a wall. There are no more lands within easy reach of the extractive industries to develop. All of the areas that are within easy reach are now in production. So we are now reaching that place of depletion, the worst word you could possibly mention to an economist. These deposits are being, the ones currently in production, are being exploited at such a rapid rate to sustain our civilization that they are being depleted very rapidly and being emptied out. And it's, they will not be able to sustain our civilization for very much longer. And if you take, if you put depletion into the, all the economic models, capitalist or any others, and you add that into the equation and the whole system falls apart like a house of cards. What am I talking about? Let me give you one example, oil. The single most important commodity in the international global economic system. Oil provides 97% of the world's transportation energy. So without oil, you can't have globalization, you can't have cars, you can't have suburbia, you can't have mechanized agriculture, uh, you can't have armies, that I mean mechanized armies. Uh, virtually all industry comes to a standstill. Right now we get about 90% of our oil from several hundred large oil fields, mostly discovered 30, 40, 50 years ago, like Gawar in Saudi Arabia, Canarel in Mexico, and, uh, and others like them. These fields have produced, supplied most of our oil and continue to do so. According to the International Energy Agency, uh, this is the um, an analytical arm of the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, otherwise known as the Club of Rich Nations, not talking about a left-wing think tank here. This is the rich countries. Um, they say that these fields, the currently producing fields, are going to lose 75% of their output over the next 25 years. That's about 65 million barrels a day. When that's gone, there will be no more industrial civilization. It will be over if they're not replaced. And the same is true of virtually every other commodity on which we rely. If we re could rely only on the existing deposits of oil, natural gas, copper, coal, uranium, and everything else, the existing sources of these materials are being depleted at a mind-boggling rate and will soon be emptied. Now, I'm not saying that the Earth's 
supply of oil and these other materials is disappearing. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that all the known, easily accessible deposits of these materials are now in production and are being depleted. And there are none known to us in easily accessible locations left to exploit. What does this mean? There's only one, well, there are only two recourses left to us to change our way of life and create a new civilization, and I'll come back to that later, or the choice that uh, we are making currently, which previous civilizations have made, what I call hyper-extraction, which is to go to the extremes, to go to those few places left on the planet that for very good reasons have been neglected up until now because they were considered inaccessible. The Arctic, Siberia, Tibet, the innermost Amazon, war zones like Iraq and Afghanistan and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and rock formations that harbor oil and gas like shale rock that were considered too impenetrable in the past with existing technology to exploit. So these areas do harbor. The Arctic has about 30% of the world's remaining oil and natural gas. And uh, Canadian tar sands contain about a trillion barrels equivalent of oil. So there are reserves, but these are not easily accessible, easily refinable materials. They require aggressive means of extraction. They require far more force to extract them. If we're talking either physical force, in the case of shale rock, the rock has to be smashed. Hydrofracking, the process of hydrofracking, fracking means fracturing, it means smashing the rock with water under immense amounts of pressure. Or it means military force as in starting wars, like the war in Iraq, to acquire oil that was otherwise inaccessible. So what remains of the world's resources can only be obtained through the use of, of extreme force of one sort or another, or going deep underground in the ocean. Again, you have to use extreme means of extraction. All that remains of the world's resources of a, co of a conventional nature, hydrocarbons and metals and the like, are of this character. They can only be extracted using extreme means. To extract in the Arctic, every vessel, every piece of equipment has to be armored, as if armored for war, except armored against ice flows or icebergs. If you're operating in the deep oceans, you have to deal with pressures that are infinitely greater than on the surface or in shallow waters. I think you can see what I'm saying. This is what I mean by hyper-extraction. This is qualitatively, quali qualitatively different from anything we've seen before. It's more costly, more invasive, requires more energy, releases far more greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and risks more lives. So what are the consequences of this? In the first instance, you have to expect far more environmental risk. This follows naturally from the fact that you're operating in more forbidding, extreme, and fragile environments and using more force to extract resources. The proof of this, of course, is the Deepwater Horizon disaster, which was just three years ago this month. This event occurred in part because of greed and incompetence. There will always be greed and incompetence in, these, in this industry. That's a given. But it was magnified by the extreme underground pressures that ensued where 
even the smallest, this was a mile of water and then a mile more underground where the, the, the pressure on the equipment was infinitely greater than it would be at the surface so that even the smallest misstep, and there were a series of them, was destined to result in a catastrophic failure with lasting environmental consequences. That's what we learned about the Deepwater Horizon. We saw a similar set of situations last summer. Didn't receive the attention it deserved when Royal Dutch Shell attempted to commence oil drilling in Arctic waters off of the coast of Alaska. Once again, a series of missteps driven by greed and incompetence, once again, uh, led to the utter failure of uh, Shell's multi-billion dollar attempts to drill in the Arctic. Now, fortunately, this occurred before they actually started drilling for oil when they were still in the test phase. If they had been drilling for oil and these missteps occurred, the environmental catastrophe would have been many times worse than in the Gulf of Mexico because in the Arctic, the species that live there are already endangered and have much less capacity to overcome the consequences of an oil spill. So this is just one uh, expression of this. The environmental consequences of using more force in more extreme environments means that any time there's an environmental danger, it will be multiplied many times over. Think about hydrofracking, and I know some of you are especially concerned about that. To extract the natural gas and oil from the shale formations of Pennsylvania and New York State is going to require tens of thousands of drills. That's the only way to do this efficiently. Tens of thousands of drills which will intersect underground uh, aquifers that supply the water supply of New York City and many other large populated areas. Yes, I know the industry promises that they're not going to make mistakes. But uh, t they cannot do tens of thousands of these without there being a misstep. It's just not possible, and the consequences would be catastrophic. This is inevitable in this process of extreme extraction. This was certainly the sort of thing that we saw in the final stages of the Mayan Empire and the Roman Empire in their final days when they were pushing things to the extreme and they suffered a vast environmental disasters as well. What we also saw in those past civilizations as conditions deteriorated was an increase in violence, more warfare, as groups fought over a diminishing supply of resources. And I fear that we will see the same thing today if we pro continue to proceed down this path. Now, it's very true that the governments of the major powers today understand full well the consequences of starting a war, uh, especially with countries that possess nuclear weapons. So they will exercise far more caution than might have been the case in the past. Nonetheless, I see what I would consider extremely risky behavior occurring around the world where resources are concerned. I see this, for example, in the the confrontations taking place in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, which are struggles over the control of undersea oil and natural gas reserves. In the East China Sea between China and Japan, and the South China Sea between China, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and one or two other countries. Uh, ostensibly, they're about who owns a few uninhabitable tiny islands, you've heard about these disputes, 
uh, I'm sure you, 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 you think they're about these, these tiny specks of islands. What's really at stake is the control of vast undersea oil and gas reserves. And both China and Japan, in one case, China, the Philippines, and Vietnam have engaged in extremely risky behavior, sending their warships up close to each other, almost ramming each other, aiming their guns at each other, sending planes overhead, just one step removed from firing their guns at each other. And we could, that could happen at any time. Bear in mind that Japan has a mutual defense treaty with the United States. The Philippines has a mutual defense treaty with the United States. If fighting were to take place, the U.S. could become easily swept into these conflicts. I also worry about the militarization of border disputes, boundary disputes in the Arctic, which, as I say, is the one area of the world that still has large supplies of minerals, oil, and natural gas waiting to be exploited. And thanks to global warming, will become more accessible in the years ahead. Russia, Canada, Norway, are all expanding their military forces in the Arctic and engaging in increasingly uh, aggressive military maneuvers with the U.S. involved in some of these. So I worry that uh, we could see an increasing militarization of these disputes. And I could say more about that, uh, but I will uh, finish ab about the military dimensions of that. I want to uh, finish this analysis by speaking about what I see as the greatest danger in all of this. And, and the greatest problem in my mind is the delusional nature, the delusional character of all of this, of what I call hyper-extraction. The impression it gives that with added effort, if we only dig deeper into the earth, if we only go into the Arctic, we can somehow preserve our oil-addicted way of life for another generation, another decade, another year. We see this, I think, in the end stages of all the past failed civilizations. A desperate effort to preserve a resource-rich way of life at any cost for as long as possible and refusing to recognize the warning signs that tell us that it's not possible to continue that way. So you go on conquering more territories and extracting more from the earth than can possibly be replaced. At the same time, further ensuring the inevitability of collapse. I, see we, I believe we see this today. Just look at the constant advertising. If you watch, if you watch especially the, the cable shows or CNN, it seems to me a third of the advertising, maybe I'm wrong, is from the oil and gas industry and the coal industry. And what are they saying? This is my interpretation of what they're saying, and you could take it with a grain of salt. This is what I think they're saying. They're saying, trust us. Let us dig deeper, go further offshore, further north, use riskier technologies, plunder the earth, foul the atmosphere, spoil the environment. We will bring you one more fix, one more tank of gas. You don't have to give up your car. You don't have to give up your way of life. Trust us. We'll allow you to keep going on with your way of life. Kiss the environment goodbye, but we will save your way of life for another year, another tank of gas. This is what I think the advertising is saying in essence. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. Uh, but this is delusional. This is delusion. It's not possible to do this. For one thing, each new barrel of oil they're digging out of the earth requires more energy to get out of the earth. Because you dig deeper, you go further offshore, further north, you need more energy 
to do that, the cost is going to rise. You can't do this indefinitely. At some point, it's going to take more energy, more oils, more barrels of oil to get that additional barrel of oil than they're going to be able to extract. It takes more and more energy to produce Canadian tar sands than you get out. This is not, this is delusional. This is self-deception. We cannot indefinitely going down this path, I argue. So it, my, in, in conclusion, I want to argue that we have to reject these false claims, these false gods of perpetual self-indulgence of the old way of life, of infinite resource sustainability, and begin the construction of a new civilization that's based on renewable forms of everything, not just energy, everything. Anything that is to say that uh, rely, currently relies on non-renewable materials. Because it's, it's not just energy, it's everything. We have to use what we have more efficiently. We have to abandon waste in all of its forms and live much more frugally on the face of the planet so that we avoid the fate of the past civilizations uh, that failed. Otherwise, I think we're going to repeat what we've seen in the past. So that's, that is the essence of my argument. I hope that I uh, riled you up a little bit, and I welcome anybody who uh, cares to challenge me on anything I said. My purpose is to stimulate discussion. Um, I'm, you can see I'm deeply troubled by what I see, and um, if, you find, uh, if you find flaws in my argument, I will welcome hearing from you. Thank you very much. I saw your hand first. Um, no, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said. Uh, you've enlightened me on a couple of things. Uh, if we can take this hyper concept and, and hyper forward with a prediction, okay, which might be more than a prediction, uh, you talked about how people were for the Roman Empire, uh, their oil. I think uh, one example is we're going there today. The lowering of wages, what's happening with people as commodities uh, for the empire. Uh, you know, uh, I think the empire knows what they're doing. I'm glad you didn't call it the American empire because I'm an American and it's not me. I think we have a corporate imperialistic empire that is a nation above the nations. Uh, and if, if you think this is true, I'd like to hear your comment on this, okay? They know what's happening. They know where they're going. I think they're very smart. So is there a plan, a backdoor that they see in their minds? And I have read some things that part of that is to reduce the population of the planet by billions of people, you know, down to a billion people or two billion people. And then they have a nice little world that's sustainable for them, run by the one-tenth of one percent. I'd like you to comment on, 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 on my projection of, of what I see as uh, an answer to where we might be going. They have a plan. Unfortunately, we the people don't have a plan to sustain a new way of life for ourselves. Um, interesting question. Um, as I see, the world has many centers of power. There certainly is a global, corporate, transnational, corporate class of, of powerful people that extends way beyond the United States. Um, but there is an, a, an American power elite. My, my former teacher, C. Wright Mills, used that term, the power elite. Uh, but there's, there's a power elite in China, which calls itself the Communist Party. Uh, there's a power elite in Russia. Um, around Vladimir Putin. There's a power lead in India, in Brazil. There are centers of power. Uh, these, are, the, these share some values, these powers that be, 
share some values of accumulation, um, but they also competing with one another. Uh, so I don't think you can draw any conclusion about who they are. Uh, I think that that in all of these centers of power, there are very powerful interests that share an interest in preserving a consumerist way of life. That is a, 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 cons, a, a econ economic model based on consumerism. It certainly is the case of the Chinese Communist Party. Consumerism is the essence of communism today in China in Vietnam, in uh, many places, in Russia. Uh, and consumerism, consumerist way of life, requires ever greater resources, mainly fossil fuels, and hence the warming of the planet. That's what I see. Uh, and there are very powerful economic interests that benefit from that model. I don't think they have the kind of vision you have of a smaller planet. They just want to get rich. Yes? Hi. So I would like to say that I completely agree with everything that you said. And I would say that pretty much everyone in this room would also agree with what you Maybe said. Maybe not. I hope there's some people who disagree. <laughs> so my question to you is then, since a lot of people hearing this are probably of the same, like you said, there's different opinions, but how would you convince someone who is not necessarily like a fossil fuel ex executive, but someone who is like, works on an oil rig or depends on fossil fuels as their job, how would you convince them to sort of back away from this industry while still keeping their livelihood? And then also, how do you go about getting people to sort of see where you're coming from when they're so involved with these fossil fuels and they're never going to want to give up the money? I wrestle with that question all the time, so I'm not going to say I have a glib answer to that. Um, I sometimes rely, I would, I sometimes rely on an intergenerational answer to that. Uh, some of the people in this room appear to be my age and uh, are not going to probably live to see the worst aspects of what I talk about. But some of the people in this room are going to be around for that, and certainly my students are. And you, for example, and my students, I say, you have a vested interest in the outcome of this conversation. Depending on which way we go, your life is going to be better or worse. So you better, your generation, you better start taking the reins of this conversation because uh, it's not a given which way it's going to go. And if you want to live on a planet that's habitable, you better do something about it now. That's one way of approaching this. And that's the way I talk to people who are going to be around 50 years from now because we can make some pretty good projections of what the planet will look like 50 years from now if nothing is done. It's not going to be a pleasant place. And, you know, I could be much more specific about that. I wouldn't buy any real estate in Cape Cod because Cape Cod may not exist. For example, uh, or Florida. And, you know, and I could give other examples. Uh, so depending, you know, so depending on which path we take, um, so that's one constituency. Um, I also think this is a matter of, you'll forgive the word, patriotism. You know, what kind of America do you want to live in? Do you want to live in one where the oil companies are raping the fuck out of your countryside? Or do you want to want, live in one where, where this beautiful green landscape is preserved? Hmm? Which way do you want it? Okay, you, get, you can make some bucks. You can let them come up with their equipment and fuck over your land. We're talking amongst ourselves now, right? 
that's what they're going to do. Uh, so, uh, you know, what kind of country do you want to live in? Yes, there will be some benefits, uh, but there is also benefit in keeping the country a certain way that we can uh, feel good about turning over to our grandchildren. And I, you know, so there are different ways of approaching this question. So the, what you asked is very important, and it requires a lot of careful thought. And I don't have the answer to everything. You. This is something that's gotten a quite a bit of attention lately uh, because it's become, pe people have become aware of the fact that a lot of land grab is when a foreign company or government agency buys land in another continent, uh, farmland in another continent, displaces the people who live there, who might be using it to grow food for their own use, to produce either food for export or, as you're saying, to grow crops to make energy for export. So a lot of this is happening in Africa and typically on land, maybe in Ethiopia, Sudan, Kenya, where the, the land is occupied by pastoralists, herders, who, who don't have legal title to the land but have indigenous people who have lived there for generations, centuries. And the government says, oh, this is virgin land. That's the that's the word that's used. This is virgin land. Uh, we can come and take it away from you. Um, and the army comes in, guns, 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 shoot, shoot, shoot. You know, throw people off. Um, a foreign corporation comes in, money handed over to the proper government officials. In the pocket it goes to a Swiss bank account. Um, and they're producing oil for ex, uh, palm oil for di biodiesel or whatever. And there's a growing protest movement in Africa and in uh, elsewhere. And it's a growing source of concern. Yes, and then you, and then you. One, two, three. Oh, there, there are too many of you with questions, but you go first. We shut down universities, we closed corporations for a few days at a time, we went to jail again and again, some of us haven't given it up, we're still going to jail. I'm in communication with people all over the country, uh, leaders of the veterans movement, and a lot of the ecology and other movements, uh, economic reform. The big thing is, I'm 67, why the hell should I care? But I'm going to keep on doing this like I have for 40 years. Can you give us any insight, even just one person? people that should be most involved are the ones who've got the most to lose. The younger generation, we're all talking among ourselves, we are not doing an effective job getting people to defend the planet, to restore them. No, I, 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 I have to disagree with you on that. Now, I, I will confess I'm a great admirer of Bill McKibben, and of Vermont, of, you know, who's a Vermont person, and his campaign of divestment of, of university um, endowments in fossil fuel companies has lit a spark of young people. And I understand that's the case here. I don't know if any of you are part of that. Uh, certainly on my campus, I was at a protest last Friday at UMass that had hundreds of students 
and I know this is happening all over the country where college students are taking the leadership on this. So I know that, and I've seen it with my own eyes at the Keystone XL pipeline protests and elsewhere, uh, there is a lot of student activism on these climate issues and hear it from me, you know, I think we have a, a, we owe a debt of thanks to Bill for getting this all started. Yes, I promised you, and then, then someone else, but I promise you. Scientific American, which is pretty much the voice of the establishment of the scientific community for the lay person. Uh, September 2010, they paid peak oil 2014. That was before the tracking really took off, so it might be a little bit delayed. But they were talking about peak oil. They also went to plenty. I'm an expert on peak oil. What's the question? But you and they are very much on the same wavelength about the problem, and they don't have much to say in the way of solutions. So yeah. to carry on, we got to be busy with the solutions. Yeah, oh, OK. Now, the, the problem with the peak oil argument, peak oil is a point at which world oil production will re reach a peak in terms of millions of barrels a day, and then inevitably decline. And then inevitably decline. Um, as I described, we're in a moment of hysteria, global hysteria, over our oil need, our fix. Now, when you're in a moment of hysteria, you do crazy things. That's what we're doing. Uh, so if you're in a state of panic, you can increase oil. We can increase oil. We can push the peak off by going into the Arctic, by going further offshore, by, by converting tar sands, by um, fracking shale rock for oil. So it, it, the, the the predictions about peak oil did not take into account the ability of the oil companies to bring the most advanced technology ever created by humankind, which is the case, far more advanced than space technology, to get to this stuff. That's, this is what I mean by desperation, by hysteria. ExxonMobil is spending more money than NASA to get at this stuff so that they can preserve the oil way of life as long as possible. That's what I'm talking about here. So we have to be a little bit careful about making these predictions about peak oil. If it weren't for that, we would long have, we would have passed peak oil. But they are, they have been able to, to push this further a bit. How much longer, I don't want, I, I can't guess. Uh, but they will be able to increase output for X number of years before it will come. And when it comes down, it's going to come down fast. It will come down fast because, as I explained, the older fields, the, the, the day in, day out, what, elef what they're, they're called elephants, the big fields that have supported oil civilization up till now are running out rapidly. So right now we're getting, uh, we're getting a boost from this new technology. And it'll give us a momentary boost. But when that boost ends, there will be, the older fields will have to climb. So we're going to see a rapid drop off. Now, um, now we could have a long technical discussion. Is that 2015? Is it 2020? I don't know but the oil age will come crashing down in the not too distant future. You're all the way in the back, you. next Saturday specifically to take up the question of labor and the climate justice movement at the Eco-Socialist Conference down in New York at the uh, uh, Barnard College. 
if you take up that question, I'll take up the question of divestment, which was raised as well. It is a, it's sponsored by the Eco-Socialist Contingent of Revolutionary Green and Red Coalition Fighting Climate Change. I wanted to encourage folks with questions like that or with activists taking on these questions to check out the conference. There's flyers at the back table and carpool sign-up sheets as well. Thank you. Thank you. You. Me? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you'd care to comment on the recent, fairly recent discoveries of oil and gas off the coast of Cyprus, extending over to the eastern Mediterranean, and what this may have to do with some of the conflict in that region involving, obviously, Syria, Israel, Palestine, and ultimately the great game, namely Russia has a military base in Syria, it's hardly ever mentioned. So can you comment on the gap, on those finds, and also possibly how the media often doesn't address them and doesn't relate them to what's going on? Yeah, I don't know that this is, I could provide any wisdom that will enlighten this audience. To some degree, this is a moving target because so much of it is new. I don't think the media has caught up to it. I don't think political scientists have a clue as to what's going on. I follow this closely, but I don't know that you could, I don't know that you could draw any conclusions. It certainly is going to play a role in how the dispute between the Republic of Cyprus and the Turkish enclave plays itself out. It certainly plays a part, certainly plays a part in the recent rapprochement between Israel and Turkey, for sure, because if, 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 because Israel, one, if Israel is to export any of this gas from the Leviathan field, it's going to need, it's going to need some degree of stability and cooperation, and that makes Turkey a player. But if Turkey is going to be a player, Turkey is going to want the Turkish enclave in Cyprus to enjoy some of the benefits of that. So how this will play out, I don't really know the answer to that. And what that has to do with the financial crisis in Cyprus, I don't know either. I don't think it has anything to do with Syria. It does have something to do with politics in Lebanon and Hezbollah, because Hezbollah has threatened to bomb those facilities. That's probably the extent of what I know. Uh, over there, you. Can you talk more about... I'll try to, try to get everybody as best I can. Can you talk more about solutions, like such as how you see this social uprising that you view as necessary, how you see it playing out? The way I see things happening is that conditions will continue to deteriorate, and they won't—they won't happen gradually. They'll happen. They'll conditions will deteriorate, deteriorate, and then get really bad, and then deteriorate, and then get really bad. So, for example, Hurricane Sandy in New York City was one of those, and that has led to a whole lot of developments in New York City and surrounding areas. There'll be more events like that that will be wake-up calls. Each time there's a wake-up call, you'll see dramatic progress. That's the way things will happen. Uh, now, in the meantime, what I see happening is that a lot of people, like people in this room and people at UVM and people in Burlington and people in Vermont and in Massachusetts, where I am, experimenting, creating laboratory-scale models of what has to be done. You may have heard of eco-villages and transition towns and all kinds of experiments of what we need. Some of these will fail because the ideas just don't work out in the real world. Some of them, however, are going to provide the germs of the ideas we're going to need on a large scale. Every campus in America, I hope, will become a laboratory for innovative thinking. 
So that's what I th think um, my campus, Hampshire College, that's where I'm based, uh, with our new president, we want to turn our campus into a living laboratory for sustainability. And many other campuses are following this model. So the idea would be that, you know, a what is a campus but a small city, a small community? If we can turn all of our colleges, our towns, into laboratories for sustainability, as the need becomes more desperate, people will say, aha, look what they're doing at UVM. We need to copy that. So it's a combination of laboratory scale, or small scale experiments, testing the ideas we need, the innovations we need, and events in the real world, pushing people to a point where they say we have to adapt. That's the way I see things happening. Go ahead, and then I'll come on this side. Come back, go back and forth. Not being an economist and not being sufficiently knowledgeable to answer your question, I'll give you my best guess. My, my best guess is that we're going to go through a time of severe stress in which we will see, um, we'll see the rise and fall of systems, depending on their capacity to adapt. And this, this is, yeah. Uh, this, this, this will be something that they can control. Climate change is unforgiving. Uh, resource depletion is unforgiving. So some systems, some corporations will adapt and survive, and some systems, social systems, corporations, and others will adapt and survive and others will fail. That's what I think will happen. Will capitalism survive under those circumstances as a system? Maybe in some forms it will. I, but you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm better equipped than that. But I think we are at a time in world history that has occurred in the past when you have a systemic crisis and some systems collapsed utterly, and others went through a process of innovation and change and rebirth in new forms and survive. That's what I think will happen. Um, and I think that, you know, we're seeing this on, the, on a planetary scale now, uh, where Germany is attempting to be the leader in the new energy technology and sustainability under a capitalist system of some sort, social democratic, so, some, some form of that. And maybe as conditions deteriorate, Germany may emerge as a new kind of a leader and the American system of capitalism may collapse. I can envision that. Maybe Japan will thrive in this new environment, maybe it won't. Maybe China will manage to copy Germany but maybe it won't. But I think we'll see the rise and fall of systems. That's what I think. Two or three more. Yes, I promise this person, I'll get you back there, and one other, maybe, one or two others. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I don't 
think it'll ever get that high. Close. No, never. Oh, maybe nine, nine billion, maybe max. But my point is, wind, is, wind and solar energy are low yield forms of energy. Uh, can they satisfy the needs of, uh, of the population? I think probably not without other innovations. Yes. main issues I, I hear every time I am uh, studying environmental activism is I'm just so damn depressed. Uh, it just seems like there's nothing we can do because there's all these corporations and they're doing all these things. But environmental justice issues are social issues. They're social justice issues. Corporations are destroying our planet. They are destroying our future. Radiation is, is destroying reproductive rights. People can't breathe in cities. So we need to take these up as social justice issues, and there are things we could do. You know, we need to take these up as justice. I wouldn't drive my car if we had high-speed railways and I got a week off of vacation so I could actually go somewhere, you know, in a year. So I really like your question about how, how you know, we are the ones, um, you know, we're the ones who are making this country run, not the corporations. It's, and people are waking up. People, uh, you know, aren't so tied to their, you know, freedoms or whatever it is that they, they don't want a better life. I mean, from what, what Keith was talking about, that's activism from the divestment campaign to these two young women in the front who are starting activism at their school for the first time. People are really, uh, yeah, people are really excited. You know, we, gotta, we need to tap into this energy because the corporations, the 1% does not have a good history with social justice issues. You know, they're the only ones who are going to be able to do it, so we got to this and do it, and, and, and I want to know, you know, I don't think that, I disagree with you that we can do it in pockets, in that laboratory pockets, that's a good idea, but I don't think people will just say like, oh, that one campus there is doing it, so let's try it in the yeah, I, city. I, I, I think, let me finish. I think that, <laughs> I think we really need to, uh, you know, we got to take this head on, and everybody's got to work together, because this is our planet, and they are destroying it, and we don't have enough time. Yeah. And that's the essence, on the record, of uh, real communism. <laughs> I, I didn't say that the pockets were the solution. I said the pockets were the places where we'll test out the solutions that everybody is going to have to adopt in time. Somebody has to go first. That's all I said. Uh, but we have to, they also have to be places of even. Evangelical evangelicism, uh, however you say that word, go out and spread the word. Uh, okay, you, and then you, and then that's it. Sense of how things can be transformed by the majority mm -hmm. to save our civilization. 
mobilization. And that, I think there's tremendous hope for organizing that project right now. But we have to sharpen this green jobs argument because that's the thing that corporations are going to nail us on. And I think Bill McKibben has done great work, but we've all got to be doing this in our communities because they're coming for us. But we have to have a solution in the way that I talked about. Thank you. I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that I, I necessarily disagree with what you say. My my worry or my concern is that most of the alternatives to capitalism that have sprung up in the past 150 years or so are also pro-growth uh, models that promise whether socialism or communism that are they are variations on the same theme of promising more growth for workers, and they have entailed the same kind of environmental extraction and exploitation as capitalism has. And it, it, that, that whole notion of, of extractionism and consumerism and growth has to be challenged. And it's not, I believe, an exclusive property of capitalism. I'm, but I'm, I'm not saying that what you say isn't true, but I don't think it's exclusively the characteristic of capitalism. It is, a, it is something that has been with us since the Industrial Revolution. I mean, all of these isms are, I fear, are, are tied to industrialization. Do I have an, an answer to that? I do not. But I certainly see it as a fruitful a area for discussion. And maybe, oh, I promised one other person a question. Uh, because that would be a good place to end for more discussion. But please, I did promise. pursue all kinds of innovative solutions that do not entail the exploitation of the earth. And there are many ways of pursuing that, and indigenous people certainly have much to contribute. There are many others who are pursuing uh, other, uh, there are other people who are pursuing alternative ideas, the eco-village movement, transition towns, plenty of colleges and universities that are looking at a whole lot of ideas. We have to harvest all of these ideas and look for the ones that are the best. There are new cities being created in China and other parts of the world, even in Abu Dhabi, a new city being built that's going to be totally uh, zero effect on the climate and so on. We have to do more and more and more of these experiments so that we create a, a, a pool of knowledge on which to build a new civilization. Everything has to be mined for, for the ideas that we need. And I think that's the point to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>